on the blood of Christ. And I was busy with my message yesterday, yesterday morning, yesterday late afternoon, and I was heading in a certain direction. But it was one of those moments that I just knew God wants me to, to focus on the blood today. You all, know, you all know that song, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Uh, I'm not so sure what percentage of born-again Christians know anything about the power of the blood of Jesus. And I was so excited this morning when I left home. I listened to Eris here in the car. There was this amazing testimony of a man who was in a a car accident, and uh, he was injured terribly. He died twice. They brought him back to life once at the scene and once in the helicopter. And uh, He was declared brain dead, but there was one medical doctor who was a born-again Christian um, supporting him uh, at, at ICU. And for some or other reason, this doctor just believed uh, that this man was not supposed to die. And his, his colleagues said, look, this man is brain dead. There's absolutely nothing that we can do. And he mentioned all the injuries, from head injuries to broken ribs, and fractures, and ugh, terrible. And uh, make a long story short, he gave his testimony he was healed completely. And after 19 days in the hospital, he was discharged without a single operation. And then he ended his testimony on Aris here this morning, and he said, this happened to me because of the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now please hear my heart. It's always a challenge to come up with fresh bread on a Sunday morning. You can have a wonderful sermon. You can have a wonderful message. But it's not time, if it's not timely, if it's not food in season, I miss the mark. I miss the point. But that was confirmation. Late yesterday afternoon, after the lions in Joburg roared, I went back to my study, and I was halfway through my preparation for this morning. And I just, got, I just got this prompting. God wants me to say a few things about the blood of Jesus. And then, and I, then I prepared for, for that message. I've got four type pages in front of me. And then this morning, in the car, this guy's testimony, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. He ended his whole testimony by saying, Dit het met my gebeur, wees die kracht van die bloed van Jesus Christus. Now I know you haven't heard this for the first time, but what I want to do this morning is I want to release verbally. Look, we, we live primarily in the spirit realm, not in the physical realm. I know we feel, many times we feel more comfortable in this, in this physical realm. But I'm telling you, we are primarily spirit beings. And we live our lives primarily in the spirit realm. And the spirit realm is, is real. And what I want to do today is to release certain words, certain truths, life-changing and life-giving truths about the blood of Jesus in the spirit realm. You see, the enemy fears, not me, not you, not flesh and blood. He fears the blood of Jesus. And if he hears and take notice that in this house, 
and in all the houses that is represented here this morning, we honor and we esteem high the blood, the precious blood of the Lamb. He will take His hands off. Because He fears the blood. So when we say these things, when we preach it, we release power and divine influence in the spirit realm in Jesus' name. And this is what it's all about this morning. This is very basic. This is so, so basic. I just want to say a few things. I think our ignorance about the power of the blood of Jesus is partly due to a negative connotation attached to words like blood and bloodshed, etc. It's also because of a lack of spiritual understanding about the fact that the life is in the blood. Our 21st century mindset connects blood, listen to this, it connects blood to warfare, to terrorism, to conflict. We see and hear through the media all the negative aspects of bloodshed. Millions of people have died since World War I and II. Many others in wars and conflicts after that. In ethnic cleansing, in tribal wars, in racial conflicts in gang fights in our neighborhoods, even in religious conflicts. Just think of the recent brutal killing of so-called infidels by the Islamic State. The media feeds us with the negative information and it, it leads to a, a negative mindset and a negative perspective about blood. And I just want to throw something in here. You follow the news as uh, in the, during this build-up to next week's elections, and I've read several times about political killings in KwaZulu-Natal, where the one ethnic group kill members of the other ethnic group, where the members of one political party are killed by members of another party, and that is to eliminate your enemy. But you know, as I was pondering on this, the Holy Spirit just said to me this, the shed blood of no human being will bring peace. It is only the shed blood of one man, Jesus Christ, that brought peace to our lives. You can assassinate all your political opponents. You can kill them. There can be a lot of bloodshed, and that, was, that is what happened right through the history of man. There can be a lot of bloodshed. That is the demonic counterfeit of the enemy, getting us to the point where we believe that if we can kill our opponents, if the blood of our opponents will flow, that will bring peace to the neighborhood. It is only the blood of Jesus that can bring peace to our lives, to our town, our province, our nation. Listen to this. Satan has convinced many people, even Christians, that it is more important to be politically correct and not offend people than to put emphasis on the blood of Jesus. There's a satanic strategy all over the world, and this strategy wants to produce a bloodless church. And a bloodless church will be a powerless church. I am called as a preacher of the gospel. In other words, as a preacher of good news. I am called to emphasize the power of the 
precious blood of Jesus Christ. Satan hates the blood. Why? Because it speaks of his eternal defeat. Revelation 12 and verse 11 says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And listen to this. this is, these are the words of Jesus. And I know this is not the kind of message that will stimulate your intellect. This is the raw gospel as you will find it in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Listen to this. This is Jesus speaking. And that's why the tables are set this morning. It's from John 6 and verse 53 to 56. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Go and tell this to a sophisticated intellectual audience. Uh, it, it's going to sound strange. If they're not born again, if the Spirit of the living God is not residing within them, these three verses from John 6 is not going to make sense to them because you can't grasp that with your intellect. You need your spiritual capacity, your reborn spirit, to understand the significance of these words of Jesus. But these words is exactly what we will celebrate when we gather around the table this morning, we will eat the flesh of the Son of Man and we will drink His blood. We will partake of the bread of life. <laughs> okay. Genesis 3, verse 3 uh, uh, verse 7 and verse 21. He saw, I said to a lady, made an appointment during the week. I didn't know her from a bar of soap. She just made an appointment. Wonderful person, very, very intelligent and hungry for truth. Really a, a, a dedicated truth seeker. But she listened to one of my messages on Ereshia. It was broadcast on Ereshia three or four years ago. And it was about the impact that Jesus made on society and on civilization. And because she's got this, what is now the great word, inquisitive mind, she and her brother did some research and they came up with a lot of arguments um, trying to prove me wrong historically uh, in certain things that I mentioned in that message. But we had, a, we had a wonderful conversation, and I just looked at this woman, and I saw myself 25 years ago. I literally, her face, her determination, her hunger for truth, sent her on a mission. And she took off at work to come and see me for half an hour, and it wasn't as if she wanted to criticize and prove me wrong. She was sort of saying, no, but listen to this. What about this? What about this? What about this? And I just realized that's exactly where I was 25 years ago, 30 years ago. I walked around looking up in the sky and said, God, if everything that these Christians, these crazy charismatic Christians, if everything they say about you is the truth, please reveal yourself to me and I will lay down my life for you. Now don't say that to God. Here I stand. I did exactly that. But one day, in my search for truth, I walked into a bookshop and it was just my habit. I was 
reading five books a week. I walked into a bookshop, and what I did is I just went into one of the departments and, and uh, looked for a, a book that interested me and uh, that I would love to read. And as I walked into this bookshop, it was the only time that it happened to me like that. I walked into the bookshop, my eyes fell on a book, and the title of the book was The Chemistry of the Blood. And it was written by a medical doctor called, called M. R. Dahan. I opened the book, Spiritual Russian Roulette, and I read the page, and it was about Leviticus in chapter 17 that says, The life is in the blood. You can be in perfect health-wise. You can be in a perfect condition. All your organs can be absolutely healthy and functioning normally. If you lose too much blood, you will die. The life is in the blood. Often what is true in the natural is true in the spiritual. The life, our spirit life, our eternal life, starts with the blood of Jesus Christ. Without the blood, we are spiritually dead. And I just want to read these two verses from Genesis 3, verse 7 and verse 21. He saw, it's, it's amazing what he gebeur het. This net na die sonneval. Die sonneval is nog vars. Arm en Eva slik nog aan die vrug, wat hulle geëet het, wat hulle nie mag geëet het nie. Het is nog vars. Nee. Net daar, net daar, bou God een skaalmodel van hoe ware redding gaan werk en gaan gebeur voor en toe. He didn't waste any time. He had his plan for our salvation ready even before the foundation of the world. The word says that the Lamb, Jesus Christ, was slain before the foundation of the world. God the Father was not caught, who say me is that known in English? Of God. I see onkant gevang. There is wonderful. He was waiting for it. It was like moments after the fall, he implemented his plan of salvation, and the whole plan was built around blood. Listen to this. Then the eyes of both of them, Adam and Eve, were opened, and they realized they were naked. And we don't, we, we're not talking about physical nakedness. It wasn't as if they now realized they, they, they're not wearing clothes. Hulle het hulle kleed van heerlijkheid verloor. And that's why they realized they stand naked before God. The eyes of both of them were opened. They realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And then verse 21 starts with the word but. So immediately we see... Here comes God onto the scene, and now he's going to change everything. They made fig leaves for themselves, but the Lord made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Now, this account in Genesis 3, immediately after the fall, presents the first picture or shadow of what it would take to redeem man. And these... Two verses from Genesis 3 reveal a few powerful truths about our salvation to us. And I'm just going to mention them. First of all, it reveals to us that God is the author of salvation and He does not accept fallen man's attempt of covering his nakedness. It's a tragedy. If there is one thing that makes me sad is when I listen to Christian conversation, things Christians say, 
and things Christians do in an attempt to cover their own nakedness before God. All religions of this world, whether Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Hare Krishna, Judaism, whatever, all religions reject the blood of Jesus. It's simply man's effort to cover his own nakedness. But you even find that in Christian circles, where people try by doing good deeds, by doing good things, by performing, by serving, by whatever, they try to cover their nakedness before God. What we learn from Genesis 3 is that God is the author of salvation and He does not accept fallen man's attempt of covering. Isaiah 61 says, God has clothed me. It was so precious when Ellen stood here this morning with her rope of righteousness. It was prophetic. It was in the Spirit. I knew what was coming. I just looked at her and I said, Wow, God! Because I knew this verse is on my notes this morning. Isaiah 61 verse 10, God has clothed me with the garments of salvation and He has covered me with a robe of righteousness. You see how the things in the Spirit work together? That is what God wants to highlight. This is what God wants to emphasize. He does the covering. He does the covering. We can't do it. Ek en jy kan nie ons aan ons eie skoenveeders opke. And the second thing that we, that we learn from Genesis 3 is blood is required to cover and clothe man. As simple as that. Blood is required to cover and clothe man. Die Heere gaan, hy slag die onskillige dier, hy vat sy vel, en hy maak een bedekking vir Adam en Eva. Nou as jy die dier slag, dan vloei daar bloed. Een onskuldige sterf, in die plek van die skuldige, en bloed vloei. Dit was een skaalmodel, een skadie type, van wat so gebeur het op Golgotha. Die onskuldige sterf, in die plek van die skuldige, bloed vloei. So kom redding. En die derde een wat ons in die historie het leer, the innocent will die for the guilty. Die dier in die tuin van Eden het niks verkeerd gedoen nie. Dit was een onskillige dier wat gesterf het in die plek van die skuldige arm en even. 1 Peter 3 en vers 18 sê, the just suffered or died for the unjust. Even Judas, who betrayed Jesus, realized this when he said, Matthew 27, I have betrayed innocent blood. This is not a scale model in Genesis 3, vars na die val, what God gebouwd het vir die mense het right. My plan is van voor die grondlegging van die wereld af een plek, Hier wees ek nou vir julle, ek bou vir julle die skaal met julle kie, dis wat op Golgotha gaan gebeur. Die onskillige gaan sterf in die plek van die skillige, die bloed gaan vloei, en die bloed is lewe. Ewe gelewe. And the last point from Genesis 3, a substitute took the punishment for Adam's sin. Now a substitute is defined as a person who takes the place or the function of another. Today we can, see, we can say it's when people trade places. A substitute takes the place or the function of another. God showed us in the garden freshly after the fall that a substitute would have to take the punishment. 
And just as that innocent animal died, Jesus became our ultimate substitute and died for all of us so that we may live forever. <laughs> Life is in the blood of the Lamb. That's the gospel. That's the undiluted gospel, the undiluted good news. Okay. There's just one way to God, the way of the blood. Ek weet, theoloe, liberale theoloe, godsdienstleiders van verskillende groepen, hulle kom by mekaar, hou vergadering, vat handen, hulle bid saam, hulle bes mekaar, hulle aanvaar mekaar in die naam van godsdienstgelijkheid, godsdienstvrijheid. Laat ons het verklaar, laat ons het spreek, laat ons het sê, vir die geestes en hulle om te hoor, en vir ons allemaal om te hoor. Niemand kom na die Vader behalwe dier my nie, het Jesus Christus gesê. Hy elimineer, hy skakel uit enige ander godsdienst, enige ander sogenaamde route na die Vader. Niemand kom na die Vader behalwe dier Jesus Christus nie. Alright, ek sluit af. Blood the precious blood of Jesus, blood, is very sacred to God. There's a bloodline running literally from Genesis 1 to Revelation chapter 22. There's a bloodline that loops as a gouwe draad throughout the entire Bible. The blood is very sacred to God. First of all, God hears, I hear, He hears, the blood. Genesis 4 and verse 10, and the Lord said to Cain, this was just after the first murder on planet earth, when Cain murdered his brother Abel. The Lord said to Cain, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. God heard the blood of Abel crying out to him. In God's kingdom, these things happen in the spirit realm. In God's kingdom, blood has a voice. Abel's blood spoke from the ground and God heard it. Now, just look at Hebrews 12 and verse 24. This verse says that the blood of Jesus speaks of better things than the blood of Abel. Why? Because the blood of Abel is crying out for revenge. Eh? It's crying out for revenge. The blood of Jesus speaks of forgiveness and reconciliation. We can't be forgiven. We can't be reconciled to God without the blood of the Lamb. So God hears the blood. In the spirit world, blood has a voice. And God hears the precious blood of Jesus speaking on your behalf before him. God hears the blood. God smells the blood. Genesis 8 and verse 20 and 21, Noah, after the flood, offered a blood sacrifice to God when he came out of the ark. And the Lord smelled a pleasant aroma. Now see what Paul says in this context, in Ephesians 5 and verse 2. Christ gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The blood of Jesus smells good to the Father all the time. And I, can I just encourage you? I don't know. I don't care where you, where you come from. I don't care where you've been. If you blood washed, you smell good to God. It's because of the blood that a, a aangenaam geer gaan op en bereik God, so hy vir jou en vir my as bloed gewas is beleef. And die laaste een, God hears the blood, God smells the blood, God, God sees the blood. This is not literally. This is in the spirit realm. God sees the blood. 
Exodus 12 and verse 13 and 14, God says, When I see the blood on the doorposts, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you. The sight of blood over the children of Israel moved God to hover and protect them from the destroyer. When God sees the blood of Jesus, the precious blood of His Son on you as a blood-washed child of God, His protection is over you. God hears and smells and sees the blood of Jesus. When you are washed, cleansed, redeemed, and covered by the blood of Jesus, God hears you when you speak to Him. God smells you, and you smell good to God. It's not your deodorant. It's not your perfume. It doesn't impress Him, but God smells you because of the blood of Jesus. And God sees you as His blood-washed child. And He is constantly, all the time, uninterrupted, aware of you. God hears you. God sees you. God smells you. God is so aware of you, all the time, uninterruptedly, because of the blood of Jesus. Amen.